Hey guys, so a whole ton of new A-rated polls have just been released for the 2022 elections. We have both Senate and Governor races that are covered by this new data. And so these A-rated pollsters include Emerson College, Marist College, Survey USA, Siena College, as well as the Trafalgar Group. So some of the best pollsters out there have just released a lot of new data. And today we'll be going over these new polls and what they mean for their respective races in the 2022 Senate, as well as gubernatorial elections. And so we're going to start off with Wisconsin, where we have four new polls, two for the Senate race and two for the governor race. And these polls were conducted by Emerson College and Siena College. Siena College is the pollster that does its polls with the New York Times, so they are a pretty reputable pollster, and they have Mandela Barnes leading over Ron Johnson by 1%. This would be a pretty big deal, if not for the fact that Emerson has Johnson up by 4th. So these polls kind of cancel each other out. I think that Siena College does do a better job in terms of its method. And so right now, according to the average in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson and Mandela Barnes for the first time ever are tied. Now, Mandela Barnes was doing very well in the polling for quite a while. The early polls, every single one of them showed Mandela Barnes ahead. Even the Trafalgar group had Barnes up by 2% against Ron Johnson. Now, recently, Republicans in the Johnson campaign has been running a lot of attack ads on Mandela Barnes. And so that's one of the main reasons why Ron Johnson has done better in the more recent polls. According to 538, at one point in time, Mandela Barnes was almost the favored candidate. So right now, Ron Johnson may have a 58% chance at winning, but at one point, his odds dropped all the way down to 51. And Wisconsin at the time was expected to be the closest Senate race of the year. So there has been a considerable shift in just last week. These new polling numbers are definitely encouraging for the Ron Johnson campaign, but this race is still much closer than it should be. Johnson leading by 4% according to Emerson College is really not that big of a deal. I still think Ron Johnson is going to win by a smaller margin, and the fact that Siena College actually has Mandela Barnes leading shows that Democrats are doing much better in Wisconsin than they really should be, considering that Ron Johnson is a two-term incumbent. Even though this is a state that Joe Biden won in 2020, Biden barely carried the state. Even Trump won Wisconsin by a larger margin in 2016 than Biden did in 2020. And not just that, if you look at the governor race, you're seeing Republicans losing in a very winnable election. The Wisconsin governorship flipped to the Democrats in 2018 when Tony Evers defeated incumbent Republican Scott Walker, who is running for a third term. And so now as Evers is running for a second, he is up by 2.5% on average against Tim Michaels, and this is the largest lead he has ever had. Every single poll for this race so far, even Trafalgar, has Tony Evers winning. And the two recent polls from Emerson and Siena, these are the same polls that were conducted for the Senate race. So the same sample, and these two new polls have Tony Evers up by 2% and 5%. Siena College has Evers up by 5 And the poll that had Ron Johnson up by 4 in the gubernatorial race, they have Evers up by 2 So there's a significant difference between these two elections. And I think that Tony Evers right now has a very good chance at winning his re-election to a second term. 538 actually gives them a 67% chance at winning. Tony Evers has a 2-3 in three chance at winning his re-election against Tim Michaels. Tim Michaels is a pretty unknown candidate, and so he is not somebody that's going to perform too well. Even though Tony Evers is vulnerable as Joe Biden is in the White House, no Democratic gubernatorial candidate in Wisconsin has won a race for the governor of the state with a Democratic president in the White House since 1962, but Tony Evers is very likely to break that trend. And so right now, I have Wisconsin at the gubernatorial election as being tilt for the Democrats, while I have the Senate race as being tilt but for the Republicans. I think both of these races are going to be highly competitive, but I do think that one party does have a slight advantage in both of these elections, but it can still definitely go both ways. That's why I'm giving them the tilt rating. We also have a new poll from North Carolina, also conducted by Emerson College, and polling in North Carolina is finally starting to look a bit more normal. Republicans have finally taken back the lead. For almost a month, Sherry Beasley was the favorite candidate according to the polls, despite the fact that Ted Budd at one point had a six-point lead in this race just three months ago. So right now, Sherry Beasley is still outperforming any expectations that people had for her, but the three most recent polls have all shown Ted Budd as the favorite candidate. There was even a point in time where five polls in a row 
every single one of them had Sherry Beasley leading over Ted Budd, and three of them were funded by Republican sponsors. And even right now, Trafalgar only has Budd up by 3%. Now, the reason why I've never had North Carolina as a state that would go to the Democrats throughout the entirety of the 2022 election cycle is the fact that North Carolina polls do tend to favor Democrats, and pretty significantly. I think that the only two states that favor Democrats more in the polls is Wisconsin and potentially Pennsylvania. The polls in North Carolina really do tend to underestimate Republican support. In 2020, Cal Cunningham ran against Tom Tillis, the incumbent Republican, and still lost this race, despite every single poll showing Cal Cunningham leading. And so for me to believe that Sherry Beasley was going to win, I would have to see much better numbers for the Democratic nominee. Now, I don't think the polls are going to be as wrong in 2022 as they were in 2020. The polls were off in 2020, but Trump was also on the ballot. And of course, it has been shown that polls are more inaccurate when Trump is on the ballot. And so, of course, Trump ran for re-election unsuccessfully in 2020. The presidential polls also underestimated him, but not as significantly as they did in that Senate race. And Cal Cunningham did have a huge scandal with his wife and a, I believe it was a sexting scandal. So that really did make it so that there was good reason as to why the polls were wrong in the very end. The presidential polls weren't as off. So I don't think the Senate polls this year will be nearly as incorrect as they were two years ago. But still, a 0.3% margin for Ted Budd basically means that it's enough for me to believe, and most of you guys to believe, that Ted Budd is the favored candidate right now. And of course, things can change. I think that North Carolina is still going to be pretty competitive. But I have North Carolina right now as a lean Republican state. I think that the GOP is clearly favored here. But Democrats. Democrats are always going to keep trying to capture the state, even though they have not won any presidential race since 2008, when Barack Obama won by 0.3%, and also in a Senate race. The last time a Democrat won North Carolina in a Senate election was Kay Hagan against Elizabeth Dole in 2008 as well, where she won by 8.5%, because in 2014, it was a horrible year for Democrats, and so of course she would lose her re-election to Tom Tillis. And next up, we also have four new polls from Georgia, two of them conducted by the University of Georgia, and two of them conducted by Marist College. Now, the two Senate polls have Walker up by two and Warnock actually up by five, according to A-rated Marist, while the governor polls currently have Kemp up by eight and Kemp up by six. So two different polls here, and they all show that Brian Kemp is outperforming Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker has proven to be a pretty poor nominee. The Marist College poll shows that Ralphie Warnock is performing a 11 points better in the Senate race than Stacey Abrams is in the governor race. And so right now, looking at the Senate polling average, Warnock is ahead by 2.1%. Herschel Walker is a, again, like I said, a pretty weak nominee. He has not been that great on the campaign trail, and really, it was a mistake for Republicans to choose him so early. So Warnock has been leading the polls. Now, his margin has never really been that great. However, polls in Georgia, unlike they are in North Carolina, have been known for being very accurate. In 2020, Joe Biden was expected to win the state by one2 and according to the polls, he ended up winning by 0.2%. So a one-point difference is incrementally small when you look at polling compared to the eventual result. And in the Senate race that Warnock won, Warnock was expected to win by 2.1%. He won by exactly two points. And so even though Democrats don't have the momentum that they did in 2021 after the win for Joe Biden and the runoffs that Warnock and Ossoff won, Rafi Warnock is going to be boosted by the fact that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, and after that Supreme Court decision, enthusiasm among Democrats is higher than it is among Republicans, and higher than it has been since the 2020 presidential election. And so Warnock has been doing pretty well in recent polling. I think that he can pull off a win, and that's why right now I have Georgia as a tilt Democratic state. Of course, it's a state that only voted for Democrats once since 1992, when Bill Clinton last won the state before Joe Biden. And so and just because of that, Georgia is always going to be very competitive, at least for the next couple of years. And so that's why I only have it as being tilt for the Democratic Party. I think Democrats are favored with their incumbent, but it is still going to be a race to watch. While in the governor election, I think Stacey Abrams is going to lose to Brian Kemp. I don't think it's going to be as close as it was in 2018. In that year, Kemp only won this race by 1.4%. It was a very close election. And of course, this was before Democrats won anything big in the state before the 2020 election. And so Stacey Abrams' 1.4% loss was a pretty big deal. It was a great performance for Democrats. And so right now, I have Georgia as a lean Republican state with Brian Kemp probably winning his re-election. I think a five-point margin is probably what we're going to stay. It's not going to be a strong likely margin, but it is still going to be likely nonetheless. 530 currently only gives Stacey Abrams a 16% chance at winning, while with Warnock, he has a 55% chance at winning, making Georgia a pure toss-up on the Senate level. 
And now moving on to Utah, I'm actually going to move this state out of the solid Republican category and into the likely Republican column. So I don't think Utah is going to be solid for the GOP anymore. Now, this is because Evan McMullen is an independent candidate running and he has the support of the Utah Democratic Party. Now, this poll may show Mike Lee up by 17 points, but this poll was an internal funded by the National Republican Senatorial Committee. No poll is going to favor Mike Lee as much as this one. Mike Lee won by 41 points in 2000. 2016 to a first term, and he really is struggling to win a second. He's only up by 8.5% according to the polling average. And if you look at all the polls that have been done, one of them actually shows McMullen head. Now, this poll was funded by McMullen's own campaign, but I mean, if you look at the other independent polls that have been done, they've all shown Mike Lee leading within a likely margin. The only polls that have ever shown Lee up by solid numbers are polls conducted by his own campaign, or of course, by the NRSC. So, of course, this poll has Lee up by 17. Mike Lee's previous internal has himself up by 18, and then another one from June has himself up by 19. Every one of the other polls shows a likely margin of victory for the Republican incumbent, and so that's why I have Utah no longer being a solid race for the GOP. 538 still has it as being solid, and I mean, their simulation does not account for an independent candidate as much. They treat Evan McMullen basically as a Democrat, but in the end, I think McMullen's chances are higher than 5%, and I think that he can definitely get within 15%. Even 538 currently is projecting a margin of only 14.2%, so that's a pretty big deal. Utah, for the very first time in decades, has a, has a competitive Senate election. And now we're going to move on to some governor polls, three new polls from all Midwestern gubernatorial elections. And so we're going to go over these three races before I go back to the Senate elections. But Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois, all races the Democrats are currently defending the governorships in. And so starting off with Minnesota, we have a new Trafalgar poll. They have Tim Walls leading by 3%. The incumbent Democratic governor right now is running for re-election against Scott Jensen. And in the polling average, he's now up by 9.8%. This average has gone down slightly after the new Trafalgar poll was released, and with Tim Walls leading by 7 and 18 percent, according to two other a rated pollsters, I have Minnesota in the likely Democratic column. Previously, it was a lean state for quite a while, but now I'm pretty confident that Tim Walls is going to win it by at least 5 percent. I'm projecting a margin of between 7 and 10. 538 actually has Minnesota as a solid Democratic state. They have pinned Tim Walls leading by 10.6 percent, giving him a 95 percent chance of winning. Obviously, this is too high. Tim Walls does not have a 95 percent chance at winning his re-election. I mean, if you look at the Senate forecast, this would mean that Tim Walls has a better chance at winning in Minnesota than Michael Bennett does in Colorado. And Colorado is a much bluer state than Minnesota at this point. The Midwest is not as blue as it was before, but I have Minnesota as likely for the Democrats and 530 projects a likely margin there as well. I think his odds are just a bit too high. Minnesota right now definitely trending well for the Democratic Party. Now moving on to Michigan, we have a new poll here as well. Gretsch Wimmer's average over to Dixon is still 11%. The new poll has her up by exactly 11%, so really not too much has changed. Trafalgar even had Whitmer up by 4 and Tudor Dixon only won the Republican nomination because James Craig, the previous frontrunner, had to be disqualified because he did not submit enough valid signatures to appear on the ballot. So Tudor Dixon, as the new Republican nominee, is not well known in the Wolverine state, and she is somebody that has said that she will remove abortion rights for the people of Michigan if she's elected, and she will be able to do so as Michigan does have a legislature controlled by the GOP. 538 currently gives Gretchen Wimmer a very similar chance as Tim Walls. She currently has a 93% chance of winning, so almost a solid Democratic state. It was solid at one point in time, but as of right now, I have it as being likely just like 538. I think that Gretchen Wimmer will be able to win by a double-digit margin, and previously, I did have it as lean when Craig looked like he was going to win the nomination, but with Tudor Dixon as a GP nominee, Michigan is going to be a likely Democratic state. Now, a third likely Democratic state is going going to be Illinois. I've had it as solid for the Democrats for quite a while, but I just don't think J.B. Pritzker is going to win by over 15% this time around. In 2016 or 2018, he won a pretty impressive victory, defeating Bruce Browner by 15.7 points. Now, Bruce Browner was the incumbent Republican who was elected in 2014. Now, Browner winning in Illinois was a pretty big deal eight years ago, but still, his loss in 2018 by a solid margin really showed that J.B. Pritzker was a strong candidate, but in 2022, the National Environment simply is not the same. Donald Trump is no longer the president in office, so that's why I'm moving Illinois down into the likely Democratic column. It's still a state that I think Democrats are guaranteed to win, but just not by as large of a margin as before.
And now we're going to return to the Senate races. We only have two polls left, and these are from Missouri and Maryland. So starting off in Missouri, we finally have a polling average here. This one is conducted by Survey USA, and so the polling average right now shows Eric Schmidt up by the same margin, 11.4%. Trudy Valentine has been able to make this race likely for the GOP, according to every single poll released since her nomination. And so as a result, I'm going to move Missouri out of the solid Republican category and into the likely Republican category. And the polls is not the only reason. We have seen competitive Missouri Senate elections in the last couple of years. In 2018, Josh Hawley won his first term by just six points against Claire McCaskill. Yes, McCaskill was a two-time incumbent, and she did win by a surprisingly large 16% margin in 2012 against Todd Aiken. But still, Missouri was competitive in 2018. Hawley could have won by a much larger margin. McCaskill was not that popular either. And in 2016, Roy Blunt, who was the unpopular Republican incumbent, only won a second term by 2.8% against Jason Kanda the same year that Trump won Missouri by 18 points. Jason Kanda ran a very strong Democratic campaign, and in 2022, he would definitely make Missouri a lean state once again now that Eric Schmidt is not the incumbent as the Republican nominee in the race. Roy Blunt is retiring after this term, and so Jason Kanda, though, did not choose to run for a second time, citing mental health issues. And Donald Trump only won Missouri by 15.4% in 2020, so barely a solid margin, even though Missouri is a red state. I don't think think that Eric Schmidt right now as a candidate with no experience in the Senate, I don't think he's going to win by a solid margin. I think Missouri is just barely going to be under 15 points, just like the state of Utah. And we also have a new Senate poll from Maryland. This one shows Chris Van Hollen ahead by 23 points. Obviously, Van Hollen is going to win a second term. Maryland is one of the most democratic states in the entire country, but it's interesting to see that Larry Hogan actually led by 12 points against the incumbent Democrat, according to a poll that his own campaign did a couple of months ago. And so Larry Hogan is not going to be running for re-election as governor of Maryland. He won his re-election by a pretty large margin in 2018, considering the fact that Maryland is a very Democratic state. It voted for Joe Biden by 33 points in the 2020 presidential election. So Hogan still won by 12 points in 2018, a very volatile environment for Democrats. He won his first term in 2014, which was a much better year for the Republican Party. And so it, right now, I think that Maryland is obviously going to be solid, and you know, my rating is not going to change at all as a result of this new poll. And finally, we have just three gubernatorial races left from Arkansas, Texas, and Maryland. So we just went over the Maryland Senate race. I'm going to go over the governor race now. Westmore leads by 22 points against Dan Cox, a very solid margin. After eight years of Republican control under Larry Hogan, Maryland is finally going to flip back to the Democratic Party. And with no strong Republican in the state besides Hogan, Westmore is going to easily win his first term. He was nominated just a couple of months ago. And so this is the only poll that's been done for this race, but it does show Westmore in a very strong position. So Maryland obviously is going to stay a solid Democratic state. Well, in the state of Arkansas, we had a poll recently that shows Tarek B. Sanders only up by 11 points against Chris Jones, but this most recent one from Remington has Sanders up by 25. And so Sanders is Donald Trump's former press secretary, and his father, or her father, was actually the former governor of Arkansas. So she does have a pretty long history in the state, and she's going to easily win her election to a first term. Chris Jones does not stand a chance at all, and so Arkansas is going to remain a very solid state for the GOP. And finally, in the state of Texas, we have a new poll between Greta Abbott and Beto O'Rourke. This poll shows Abbott up by 9% as he attempts to win a third term in office. He was first elected in 2014. And so Beto O'Rourke is going to do significantly better than Democrats did four years ago, but he is still probably not going to win. He might have done well against Ted Cruz in the 2018 Senate election. That's what he's famous for. In 2018, he made headlines for almost defeating Ted Ted Cruz, he still lost by 2.6%, but this was a surprisingly close election. Ted Cruz really did do very, very poorly four years ago for his re-election. He's going to win by a larger margin in 2024, unless better work runs for that as well. He's really been running for everything since he lost four years ago. He ran for president in 2020 and is now running once again. I don't think Texas is going to flip in 2022, but the race has nearly a tiny bit in the last couple of days. We had two new polls showing Abbott only up by 2 and 3%, and so Abbott is still in a very good position overall, and so that's why Texas is going to remain a likely Republican state.
And so right now we see that the map is going to be very, very competitive. I can fill in Pennsylvania as a lean Democratic state, but I think that in Kansas, Arizona, Nevada, and Wisconsin as well, we are going to see tilt margins or at least something very close to that. These four races are going to decide whether or not Democrats will hold the same amount of governorships as Republicans. They've been behind in terms of the total for over a decade now, and the Senate map is looking very close as well. If Democrats can win Georgia, their chances at winning the Senate overall go up significantly because that means that they're probably going to win Pennsylvania and then Arizona as well which will give them 50 seats along with New Hampshire, which they're almost guaranteed to win. If Democrats can win Wisconsin or North Carolina, it's going to be a blowout for the Democratic Party, and the red wave will totally not even exist. And according to the governor's map here, if Democrats can hold on to Nevada and Kansas and then flip Arizona, which does look like to be a possibility, they will hold the same amount of governorships as the GOP. But more realistically, they're probably still going to have less. But I mean, these polls just continue to suggest the fact that both the Senate and governor elections are going to be more competitive than ever. So thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure you like it down below. If you're to comment down below, which party you think will win the Senate majority? And what do you feel about these new polls from Wisconsin and Georgia? And then the governor races, do you think? Tony Evers will win his re-election to a second term. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't, and I'll see you guys in the next video.